Welcome to Raging Chicken Radio's Out the Coop podcast, where we get a behind-the-scenes look at what's going on there in our state capital, Harrisburg. Uh, right now on the line, we've got Sean Kitchen. Sean Kitchen is our Raging Chicken press reporter who's out there in Harrisburg and our Harrisburg outpost uh, giving us the skinny what's going on. So what's happening around there, Sean? Anything uh, interesting? Well, um, the budget got passed again last week for the fourth time. For the fourth time, so so you're telling me what? It's so like spring has come and gone. So you're telling you're come and gone this past weekend, and we've, we're going to finally see a thaw. They're going to take that budget out of the freezer, and we're actually going to have a budget. No, Governor Wolf promises to veto it. Ah, uh, so um, this is just another another round of shenanigans from the GOP. Is that right? Yes. Uh, basically, this is the first budget movement since the budget fell apart last December uh, when we thought we were going to have to compromise budget of thirty two point thirty point two billion dollars. Mm -hmm. But um, that did not happen. Uh, since that time, they ha both parties not have met a grand total of zero times. And, uh, you know, I guess this is a response to Governor Wolf's blistering budget address that was last February, about a month ago. A uh, month ago, about six weeks ago, actually. So they're still <laughs> licking their wounds from that budget address, or they're just kind of still have got some hurt feelings that the governor hasn't sufficiently uh, <laughs> gone over and told them they wanna, he wants to kind of kiss and make up. Is that right? Um, I actually think that they are delusional to the point where that they will pass, actually get him to sign a budget that he has vetoed three times already. And he's promising to veto the fourth. That's pretty incredible. So, okay, so you've got this budget that's basically the rehash budget. They're just basically taking it out. They're kind of recopying the same old budget and they're kind of putting it through. Um, so there's nothing interesting, nothing to see here. Or is there anything that's going on behind the scenes that we need to know about? Um, there's actually a couple things we should know about, especially inside the fiscal code, which uh, directs how the state spends the money. It's where you can actually put in some uh, creepy amendments that uh, are like handouts to the natural gas industry. Um, last December, Penn Live and a couple of environmental blogs reported that there were three major handouts for the uh, gas industry in House Bill 1327, which is the fiscal code. And um, if the governor is to sign the budget this week, uh, these um, these deregulations and handouts will become law for the for the upcoming fiscal year. Um, one of the amendments so what, will. Yeah what, yeah, what are we looking at here? Because this is this is what you wrote about recently on Raging Chicken Press, right? This is about the yeah, Republican this, budget still has major handouts for the natural gas industry. So what are we looking right. at here? Uh, and this is also like the importance of reblogging the same story a few times throughout that that budget cycle because it mm -hmm. comes up the same the same story keeps on popping up. Um. So basically, the First Amendment would uh, roll back all the rulemaking that has gone on within the DEP with regards to regulations of the natural gas industry. Over the past three years, uh, Governor Corbett um, put, put, signed a law a few years ago asking for this rulemaking. And what the House Republicans or what someone in the Republican Party is trying to do is uh, overturn the rulemaking that Governor Corbett won three and a half years ago. Okay, so, so you got this. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on, hold on. So you're talking about rulemaking. What What do you mean rulemaking? So basically the DEP has the authority to come up with um, regulations for the gas industry. Mm -hmm. This was an issue that Governor Corbett got through three and a half years ago. They have spent this time coming through with the rulemaking process and coming up with the regulation making process. And this bill would effectively roll back any any progress that has been made over the past three and a half years. So basically, they're making rules to take away the rules. Is that is that what I'm understanding? Oh well, yeah, they're making an amendment that would um, roll back all the regulations that have been drafted within the past three and a half years. So the natural gas the industry must be pretty happy about this then. Yes, and there's even a, a second, just to sweeten the pie. Um, have you ever heard of this thing called the Growing Greener Project, Pennsylvania? Pretty big deal. Yeah, yeah. Maybe like well, maybe one of the state's most successful environmental programs of the past twenty or thirty years. Um, Something we should all thing. be proud of in the state, right? Yeah, farmland preservation uh, was Good one of the biggest achievements. Um, you know, for you being at Kutztown, there's a Kutztown professor that's one of the has one that's preserved the most farmland throughout this project. Ziegenfuss in the geography department. Yeah. Um, so it's something that hits you know local for both of us that that's we right. could see on an actual right. local level, and especially in Berks County, this would take fifteen million dollars out of that program and give it to the natural gas industry. And give it to the natural gas industry. As if they need 15 million more pennies to <laughs> to play with. Incredible. Incredible. And there's, 
And there is a third um, amendment in there. And that really helps out the natural gas industry, but will definitely help out the state's uh, coal industry that's, uh, uh, that is in decline. Um, this would delay the implementation of the EPA's clean power plan, mm -hmm. which would basically go after coal plants and make them uh, upgrade to, you know, where they're re emitting zero carbon dioxide or zero uh, sulf sulfides into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And they put large filters onto their um, smokestacks, basically cost billions of dollars for these power plants to make uh, the mechanical upgrades they need to make to be within code of the EPA's clean power plan, this would delay the implementation of that in the state by about three or four months. My God, so who are the people behind this? Who's who's pushing for these kind of changes? Well, we really can't see. Ah, who so put it's that all language? shrouded in saddle. This is all the kind of the back room garbage that we always hear about. Yeah, we can't really find out who put that amendment in there. This is pretty incredible. So just walk us through a little bit here. How is it that these kind of changes can make their way into the budget. I mean, how does that happen? Um, well, you have this bill, the fiscal code. So you have two bills. You got the budget and the fiscal code. The okay. budget is the spreadsheet. You know, it has last year's numbers, this year's numbers. Okay. You know, proposed appropriations for this year. This is what it was last year. Um, it's basically a 500-page spreadsheet, line by line, of anything that goes on department by department, agency by agency. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the fiscal code. These type of things can make it inside the fiscal code, and unfortunately, they have made it into the fiscal code over the past few years. You know, the same attacks we see on abortion, women's health rights, this is the bill it makes it into is the House fiscal code. You know, usually they get line item vetoed out of there, but sometimes they squeeze on through depending on what the agenda is. Mm -hmm. This is incredible because I think, you know, for the average person sitting around, we're thinking about budget discussions. We're thinking about, you know, okay, how much money are we going to allocate here? How much money are we going to allocate here? How much are we going to do it here? And I don't think, you know, most folks are familiar with this kind of backroom dealing that's actually going on behind the scenes of those numbers, right? So we're actually kind of seeing um, kind of political agendas getting worked out and major givebacks, uh, major money being spent. Right, essentially, right, shifted from one section of the budget to another by giving these, you know, natural gas huge benefits, whether that's in kind of direct monetary compensation or if we're talking about actually relaxation, a uh, relaxing of the regulations, which allows them to kind of further exploit, uh, you know, the Marcella Shell region and now, you know, the, the next the Utica Shell play. Yeah, and I have a great story about that, but that'll be uh, later on in the podcast. Oh, good. We got a little uh, looking <laughs> for, something to look forward to for the later half. All right, so anything else we got going on in the budget? Um, No, but medical marijuana passed the House last week. Woo! And that was a huge deal. Huge Yes, deal. but not so quick. Ah, so can't you can never be happy in Pennsylvania is what you're telling me. Exactly. Um, It's going to take at least another two or three weeks for the bill to actually become law. The bill um, was completely rewritten inside the House. Um, it was actually the amendment, the Marsico amendment, actually uh, stripped out the language of SB3, inserted it what they wanted, which is actually fairly decent. Um, it builds upon Senate Bill 3, and it was actually done by a task force of like a large bipartisan group of legislators who are really conservative and really liberal. So it was actually, we saw something get done here. Okay, Senate and, Bill 3. To explain to us Senate Bill 3. Senate Bill 3 is the medical marijuana bill that passed the Senate last year and has been sitting in the House for about a year now, over a year. So we've been basically taking Senate Bill 3, which is the medical marijuana bill, and that's been rewritten in the House, stripping out some language. Yes, but it so, wasn't, but the, the all of Senate Bill 3 got stripped out and replaced. The whole thing? With, the whole thing. With an amendment that actually makes, you could say strengthens it. Um, it wasn't like what Matt Baker or other Republicans, other uh, reefer madness Republicans were trying to do to stop the bill from being passed. This actually built upon it, um, it was built by uh, Ron Marsico, who chairs the House Judiciary Committee, mm -hmm. and this was a task force of bipartisan legislators um, to get medical to write the language in there. Um, so you're seeing these changes as a good thing? Yes. Um, in the va the previous form, you weren't able to smoke or vaporize mm -hmm. medical marijuana. In this, you can actually do that with this amendment. So that's for the better. Um, it adds sickle cell and anemia and autism to um, the list of curable diseases or treatable diseases with medical marijuana. And um, hopefully back pain is in there, you know, for us who have sick wow. disc in their lower back. 
wow, so this is pretty impressive. So this is actually something getting done. But you're saying, you know, let's not kind of have our celebrations yet. We still have got a little road to go. Yes, because this has to go through the Senate now. And the Senate has to approve these changes. And if the Senate approves the changes, then it can go on to the governor's desk. If the Senate changes anything but a comma, it has to go back to the House, and the House would have to approve that change. So, wh so we, what's the likelihood we're looking at here? I don't know. It's a wait-and-see type of game. You have, you'll see if the Senate will just accept all the changes that were made by the House, and it will go right to the governor's desk. If not, we can see some political football going back and forth uh, between chambers on something that's very popular. So we're not out of the road yet. Well, well, I have to say, I mean, uh, I, I hear your kind of cautiousness here, um, but, you know, I'm going to feel a little bit good about this. I mean, it seems like there's this has been a long time coming. And I have to say, you know, we got to give the props to those kind of activists who have been pushing for this for a long period of time, who have made their voices known and have actually, have actually educated a lot of the state legislators on what this medical marijuana is actually for. Like, for example, when you're talking about the uh, the vaporizing, right? Um, I, I remember you talking about this last year about saying that the vaporizing stuff, that was really important, especially for children, right, with uh, medical conditions. And for cancer patients. And for cancer patients. You know, because they would get the high instantly if you, whereas you take an oil for anyone who's eaten brownies or any other edibles, you know, it takes a couple hours for that thing to kick in. Mm -hmm. So the pills or the uh, little droplets that would take a couple hours to kick in, whereas the vaporization, they'll feel the high or the effects right away. And it's also safer than smoking a whole leaf. Right, right, too. right. Well, great. Getting all those impurities out there. Well, great. That's a little positive thing. So listen, we're, uh, we've got to take a little break coming up here and we're going to come back after the break with Sean Kitchen and we're going to talk a little bit more about what's happening in Harrisburg. We're going to hear a little bit about uh, some activists who took the fight directly to Pat Toomey. We want to remind you, so when you get a chance, you want to help support this podcast or the great work that we do over there at Raging Chicken Press, just go to ragingchickenpress.org slash support. You can become a member for as little as $5 a month, uh, slip us a donation or check out a whole bunch of other ways that you can help support what we do. We'll be back in a little bit uh, right after this break with Sean Kitchen. This is Raging Chicken Radio out the coop. Welcome back to Raging Chicken Radio's Out the Coop podcast, where we get behind the scenes of what's going on in our state's capital, Harrisburg, PA. Uh, so right before the break, uh, we were talking a little bit about some positive things that were happening in the state capital, uh, where we seem to have a medical marijuana bill that's that's moving forward, at least. Um, that's impressive, given the fact that uh, everything else seems to be locked in the freezer right now. Um, but just because the people who are inside the Capitol building are official legislators, uh, seem to be taking a break, at least on the GOP side. It doesn't mean that there's not a lot of activity here. And uh, I want to come back to Sean Kitchen because, Sean, uh, I understand that there was uh, some kind of actions that were taking place around the state uh, trying to encourage our wonderful Senator Pat Toomey to uh, do his job. So what was going on? Um, yesterday there were protests or demonstrations in Penn State at Penn State's main campus and then in Harrisburg and then today in Philadelphia and tomorrow in Pittsburgh, basically over uh, Pat Toomey's denying or wanting to deny Merrick Garland, the new Supreme Court justice or a Supreme Court nominee, a, uh, a vote to be sit on the bench. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure we all remember uh, and, and Scalia's body wasn't even cold yet as uh, Republicans came out and said they will not approve any um, Supreme Court nominees presented by President Obama and want to make this a campaign issue. And yesterday in Pennsylvania, we're starting to see that become a campaign issue for better or for worse. Yeah, and Toomey was really early out of the gate, uh, joining the GOP call to uh, not nominate anybody. Is that right? Yeah. And Toomey actually also has a history of doing this too. Um, he has a history of blocking his own nominees to fill federal uh, court vacancies. So this should uh, come as no surprise and uh, protesters around the state are actually letting him know that. Yeah, I find it really interesting is that this call for have Toomey do his job, I think it's an important one. You know, uh, one of the things that that's a little upsetting is because because you've got the Republicans who have come out with such a hard line and Toomey has, you know, been the hardest of those lines. I've been coming out basically saying, you know, we're not going to even give this guy a hearing. Then we end up having this discussion about the, you know, the 
the sports version of the Supreme Court nomination. Like you've got these two sides and they're arguing against one another as opposed to actually having to look at the merits of this guy, right, the, of Merrick Garland. And one um, of the things that, yeah, one of the things I was thinking about um, is that really you're, you're devaluing the sanctity of this institution, right? Not to say it hasn't been politicized over the past 30 or 40 years with, you know, merit-based tests that people have for this. You know, are you against gun rights? Are you for gun rights? Are you against abortion? Are you for it? You know, like there's the all these parameters going into a Supreme Court decision now, instead of interpreting what the law should be. Mm -hmm. But really now we're we are just like whoring this institution out, you know, for even more political purposes. You know, we're we're turning it, uh, this into a presidential election issue when this really should never be an election issue. And I'm sure our founding fathers would never want that to be an election issue. No. And I worry about the fact that if you look at some of the initial comments that came out on both sides, right? Um, first, you have the Republicans that came out just, I think you put it well, you know, before Scalia's body was even cold, uh, you had, you know, Mitch McConnell out there saying, nope, nope, nope. We're not going to even talk to anybody where no matter who Obama puts forward, we're not going to talk to them. And then you have this kind of almost knee jerk reaction um, among kind of a lot of the Democrats, right, uh, on the, the liberal side of folks, um, just automatically pushing to get this guy, uh, in some cases, get this guy nominated. Um, but really what we're talking about, we want to actually get this guy to a hearing so that there can actually be a fair hearing about what the background is of, of this guy. Is he qualified? Um, what's he going to bring to the court and so on? And I, I think that's an important question because I worry about the fact that people on the left right, could automatically fall into the trap of assuming Merrick Garland is this great guy that we need to defend right before we've even got into the guy's record. You we know, have it very moderate, right? Mm -hmm. Extremely one of the most moderate picks. And it reminds me of someone who I used to work with you know, a couple of employers ago, he has a saying, um, it has a saying, the screwing you're going to give better be worth the one you're going to get. You know, I mean, and the Republicans are going down this road. Obama's offering them a pretty moderate candidate in Merrick Garland, right? You know, down the middle for, he's pretty moderate on most issues. But, you know, they're rolling that dice. You know, if they lose the Senate and lose the presidency, it's going to be a whole lot worse for them coming up in next January. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. But I, you know, and I even think about what's what's going to be the implication if if you've got a strong push on the on the Democratic side to actually get this guy nominated. And you know, I feel a little better about Merrick Garland as uh, as a candidate after you know I was reading some of Ian Milheiser's stuff, and he was on the Rick Smith show last week talking about um, Merrick Garland's nomination. And you know, the guy is is not horrible. Um, when you get to criminal justice issues, that's where it becomes a little bit sketchy. And I think uh, the kind of black Lives Matters folks and um, anyone who's been concerned with criminal justice stuff has really got a good reason to be concerned about him as a nominee. Uh, but when it comes to some other issues like uh, labor issues and kind of women's rights, he seems to be be a more moderating force, which, you know, is, frankly, is consistent with Obama's kind of picks. Um, but uh, but it's pretty crazy. So what do you think? So is, uh, is Toomey going to do his job? Do you think he's going to come around? Is there going to be more pressure? I don't think he's going to come around. Um, he's up for re-election re this year. He's in a tough battle. Um, and he might actually, he'll probably end up losing his seat. You know, Pennsylvania, it's a presidential election year. He's up for re-election in a state that hasn't voted for a Republican since Reagan, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I believe, I honestly believe that he's going down. And this is a, this is a move. This is a last-ditch effort to rally the base and make sure that, and bring out the base in 2016. But are moderates and independents going to stay stay up for that? I don't believe so. Yeah, I don't think so either. I think that's a good call. So, listen, let, let's talk a little bit about since we're, you know, he is facing, Toomey is facing kind of one of the hardest races he's fought so far. I know Sestak is the favorite um, um, to kind of get the nomination on the Democratic, um, Democratic side. And from what I understand, you have Fetterman and McGinty who are basically tied for second. And Fetterman's, you know, he's he's putting up a pretty good fight, if my understanding is right. He is. And one of the things I was thinking about with Fetterman is this guy is campaigning on what Democrats around the state should be doing in their day-to-day -day jobs. He's bringing out the issues of rural poverty, which if you think about poverty in Pennsylvania, you think about Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Scranton, 
Reading and Allentown. You don't think about the small cities like Bradford, where he's from, but you know, rural poverty is something that is hurting a bunch of, is hurting everyone in Pennsylvania. It's something you don't see. And I think it's something that he is bringing out and bringing to light in this I, race. I think that's a really good point. And his whole frame about the forgotten cities and the forgotten people of Pennsylvania, I think it makes a whole lot of sense. And, you know, frankly, when I first came to Pennsylvania, one of the things I noticed just seriously, just about, you know, an observation about how the state, how the Commonwealth was organized is that you have a lot of these small towns, like more so I grew up in New York state, upstate New York. And it, it was, it's kind of a different geography and different ways in which, you know, townships are organized. So in Pennsylvania, you really do have a lot of these concentrated small towns, um, which have been utterly decimated, you know, who for a long time were the kind of lifeblood of Pennsylvania. You know, I was talking to uh, this contractor a couple of weeks ago and he was talking about my hometown. Um, and he was saying that, you know, he grew up in this town where I live now. And he said, you know, when he was growing up, even, you know, when he was a young kid, but when he was growing up, this town was actually a self-sufficient town. You had small industry, you had um, agriculture, you had manufacturing, you had a whole bunch of stuff. It was really this kind of self-sufficient town. And uh, a lot a lot of those towns are scattered all throughout this, uh, all throughout the Commonwealth, and they've been utterly decimated um, by, you know, the bad trade deals, by the kind of collapse of the coal industry, by the whole steel range companies, of the steel I mean, companies, yeah, Bethlehem. I mean, you had a lot. Not a lot of people. When you think about steel, you don't think about you think about Pittsburgh and Pennsylvania. You don't think about East and Allentown, Bethlehem, that part of the Lehigh Valley where you had one of the largest steel companies in the world at the time, That's Bethlehem right. Steel. You know, even here out in Harrisburg, right? You have Steelton, which is right outside the city, which still has an operating steel plant. You you drive around there certain times, they you smell the smelter going off. Yep. Um, but you know, even like looking at the rural poverty, you see it in some parts of even right outside of Harrisburg. You get you go from Harrisburg, this small city area, to one a couple of these small towns where it's poor white rural people who are being affected by this economy but they're hanging their Confederate flags outside their doors. And it's just like, you, it, it makes you stop, shake your head and wonder sometimes like, these are the people getting screwed over just as badly as those living in the city, but we're leaving them behind as Absolutely. And I have to say, you know, um, you know, whether or not Fetterman is actually uh, has got a shot to to uh, uh, to take on to me. Uh, I know Sestak is a little bit, you know, he's got a, quite some distance ahead in the polls or still some time. But man, his campaign, I think, is the right message for the future of Pennsylvania. And I think really social movements, political activists really need to pay attention to what he's saying. And one of the things I want to ask is what 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 does it say if Fetterman pulls 20, 25 percent in the primary? In a three-way primary, he pulls 20, 25%. Exactly. What, a, what does that say for McGinty? Because she's a failed candidate. She's going back to DC for a lobbying job. Mm -hmm. that, that's where she's going after this. That's what it but, looks like. Yeah, but for Fetterman, what does it say for the Democratic Party if he pulls 20, 25%? That just shows you there's a tsunami coming and there's gonna be a lot of people in leadership that better either change or just get hit by, this, get hit by the, uh, the tidal wave. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, you know, that uh, they may have to brace for that tsunami, but I know there's going to be a lot of us that are going to get out our surfboards and ride that wave. I'll tell you that. Well, listen, we're coming right up to a break. We'll be back in just a couple minutes uh, for Raging Chicken Radio's Out the Coop podcast, talking with Sean Kitchen today. Talk to you in a bit. Welcome back to Raging Chicken Radio's Out the Coop podcast. And, oh, man, spring is in the air, I'll tell you. So, uh the flowers are blooming out there in Harrisburg, Sean, right? Beautiful spring weather. I mean, it's got to be beautiful on the streets of Harrisburg. Oh, yes, it is. The trees are starting to, like, bud their leaves. And, uh, you know, once the, warm, once the weather gets warm and warm up, <laughs> once the weather gets warmed up, uh, all the lobbyists and everything, they go hit in the second street. It's like they bounce or they get paid to go bar hopping <laughs> and all free food. And they just go from fundraiser to fundraiser. So what comes out first? What comes out first, the lobbyist or the buds of the trees? Maybe the groundhog. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. But I think we're talking a different kind of rodent that's going to crawl, crawl in the streets of Harrisburg then. Yeah. So, you know, yesterday I go out to McGrath's, have a couple of beers. Uh, they had they, they had they had founders breakfast out on tap there on on CO2. 
I got to tell you right now, you're going to start talking to those folks over there. They should kind of support us on this podcast if you can keep on giving them all the free plugs. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, go ahead. So we're, I'm sitting at McGrath sipping on – or, yeah, sucking down a uh, founder's breakfast stout pint. And um, you know, someone's like second in command from one of the one of the uh, one of those like important committees. I'm not going to name which one because they'll give away the person's name. Mm-hmm. You know, comes in and he starts chatting with some of the natural gas lobbyists, <laughs> who is, who are also going to the fundraiser right upstairs. Oh, so God. you know, you, you get to see like the. I mean, these people they're friends with each other. I mean, as much as the partisan bickering you see going on. You know, in the press, these people are really good friends behind the scenes. And they're also really good friends with the lobbyists because the lobbyists were either staffers for these people 10 or 15 years ago, and they've been in the game for 20 or 30 years. You know, they go from being a being a staffer in someone's office to one of the most powerful lobbying firms in the state. And so they still have that relationship, that work relationship. And whenever you see them in the bars with each other, they're chumming it up, having a couple good beers and laughing and cracking jokes. Well, you know, it's funny is as much as we learn about, uh, you know, how bills get made and what the legislative process is like and so on. Uh, this really has become um, how business gets done. And, you know, again, every single person, I'm sure every single politician will sit there and say, oh, yeah, I know this person. We sit there, we go out for lunch once in a while and so on. But that doesn't influence what I say. That doesn't influence uh, what I put on the table. Um, but we know that to be not true. I mean, it's the same kind of stuff you see, for example, what drug companies do in medical offices, right? They send their drug reps in there to kind of buy doctors and nurses free lunches, right? Just to sit there and talk about, you know, what new products they have and so on. What, Vic- <laughs> what would Vicodin, how good Vicodin is for the soul? Or right, stuff and, like that. Right, and a whole bunch of stuff. And it's like the idea is that these folks become familiar um, and it seems normal right because that's what you know these lobbyists get together and they basically are are hammering the same message over and over um, to these politicians until it just seems like common sense um, and that's the, you know that's kind of a dangerous world and it's not even like they're talking policy or anything like that they're just ha- yakking it up having a good time and just drinking on a couple of beers i mean more work gets done at these fundraisers by just building up a personal relationship and friendship with these with these folks than what gets done in the actual building itself right and exactly you think you know if anybody out there you just you just think about it if if you are to just kind of walk off the street and you want to go see your legislator and you walk into that office you're walking in cold they don't know you from adam right and they're going to be immediately thinking, well, okay so you're a constituent what's the problem and so on and you have to spend whatever 30 seconds a minute whatever time they're going to give you um just to build up some sort of connection meanwhile these lobbyists they walk into that same office right and they're well known they're going to make joke to, joke to the staff and even if they're in disagreement right they're on these friendly terms so there's a more warmness to that engagement than anything else and i think you know that's why a lot of those businesses go, is, is done and you know frankly it just smells man it doesn't smell like spring though <laughs> no and i was talking to roxbury about this sort of this type of thing yesterday we're talking singing in the capitol watching a natural gas rally going on held by fractivists and you know you have a bunch of people who are older like literally they're older, they're in their seventies or eighties. Mm-hmm. And these are the same people that show up to every rally for every cause. No, this is a, this is a problem with the left, you know, like these lobbyists or something like that. They're, or even like your business person who needs to see his, uh, his representative, you know, is going in there dressed up shirt tie in a good suit while you have these people walking around in like sweatpants or with dreadlocks and stuff like that. Who is, who's going to take you seriously? Mm-hmm. I mean, I hate to say it, but like, yeah, you got to look the part sometimes when you're inside this, when you're inside the Capitol, you have to look the part. You got to be having a good, you have to be wearing a good suit when you talk to these folks. Yeah, it's well, it's interesting. I mean, you know, there, there's back and forth about how, you know, what, what we talk about in terms of strategy. And sure, that's absolutely true, I think, to a certain degree. But it also means that, you know, if, frankly, you if one of those guys, if one of those guys, you know, happened to be a lobbyist for a big fir- firm with big money with campaign donations, I guarantee you they would look past, you know, what you're talking about. They would look past the the sweatpants um, as long as there's going to be a big check on the other end of that. So, well, yeah. And there's also, I mean, like, look with the Mother's Day with the medical marijuana over the past um, mm-hmm. few months. They're in there every day. 
they had a waiting room set up right outside the GOP caucus doors. And every day they were badgering and badgering and badgering. And they had pictures of their sick children up on chairs with the word still waiting mm -hmm. on them and to kind of like shame these people into a vote. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, that's, that's the power, that's the power of the people that, that can kind of bring it to bear in Harrisburg. So listen, so we're just about running out of time here. We're up against the wire. So I want to thank Sean once again for joining us here on Raging Chicken Radio's Out the Coop podcast. We'll be back next week uh, with a special where we'll either going to go live or I have to say we're going to go live where we might have to do a kind of mix up depending on uh, what it looks like. It may come to you a day late. Uh, we'll, we'll get back to you with some news on that. But thanks for joining us for Raging Chicken Pro podcast. Podcast, Raging Chicken Press. Blah, blah. Thanks for joining us for Raging Chicken Radio's Out the Coop podcast. Uh, remember, you can support us at ragingchickenpress.org slash support. Um, become a member or drop us a donation, and we'll be right on our way. Thanks so much for joining us. We're out.